one of the things I, I realized some time ago um, was that when we're putting together architectures, we, if you just concentrate on or focus on one piece of the software, you, know, you focus on just your database or just your operating system, you don't really end up with a very holistic uh, architecture at the end. So what I started doing was, is I was looking around for pieces of what I think of uh, that fit and make up what is a, a modern stack. You know, uh, Your data layer particularly needs things like asynchronous ability to, to take data, caching, and all this piece to work, how all these pieces uh, work and go together. So. I became interested in all three of them uh, from the standpoint of how do we make these pieces uh, integrate and work better um, and make all of that, uh, you know, very easy to use. One thing to know about Drizzle is, is that Drizzle itself is a SQL processor. Uh, we've designed a, a SQL processor such that we can uh, take that uh, architecture and that technology and then apply it to um, additional um, storage means. Um, well, I'll be showing off one tomorrow uh, during my keynote, but we've spent a lot of time re-enabling the kernel such that we can use uh, back-end designs where we federate the information out of storage components and then bring that up. So what does all that mean? That means that a lot of the problems in the past of, say, having uh, a SQL node that was MySQL running on one box that was trying to communicate with a, a centralized data store was very problematic because MySQL was really designed around MyISAM, and MyISAM is obviously it's, it's neither transactional nor was it ever designed for being run you know, on, on multiple data stores. So we really try to take the, the kernel, uh, you know, that SQL kernel that we've got and really enable it um, so that it can use any kind of these, you know, back-end designs nowadays. You know, we, we have prototype engines out there that use Memcached. Um, there's obviously, you know, using Cassandra uh, uh, as a, a back-end. And there's a few other that we'll be showing off. And the idea, though, is to really build a SQL processor because, you know, your data may live in one part of your environment, but you're still doing processing, basically relational processing. And that's where our interest is, is providing that, that relational processing, SQL processing engine to communicate with those data backends. Well, the goal with it is to enable the environment such that, well, you shouldn't necessarily have to do those sorts of things. If, you're, if your SQL nodes that are in your, your front environment are just communicating back with the data nodes, if you need more you know, processing power, the same way you would add more app servers, you should just be able to add uh, more Drizzle nodes to that front end, you know, assuming you're using a, a shared nothing back end. Uh, for those environments. We did, though, early on go in and actually do some work to try to make some of that easier, though. If you also on the front end want to do, you know, sharding it, when we designed our new protocol, we specifically designed into the protocol things like sharding keys and other components to make it very simple to, you know, build that, build that layer up in your, your application environment such that, you know, sharding would just be built into the layer in the same way that we thought about the way we did Memcached and so forth. So, you know, make very much uh, smart clients that can then communicate uh, you know, with servers that necessarily not need to know much about their, you know, communicate with one another and know about each other. Well, the uh, exciting thing about Gearman sometimes uh, is uh, that uh, it's still in its infancy and we can actually still make changes to it. Um, the, the sometimes the most uh, um, uh, painful thing about it is we have yet to actually learn how to communicate with people exactly what all it can do. Um, you know, some people will look at it and go, well, we think it's a queue, but it doesn't really quite seem like a queue. And the answer is, yeah, no, it's not a queue. And some people go, well, it doesn't really do what Hadoop is doing, but yeah, we see these people who are using it for MapReduce, so we don't entirely understand there. And the answer is, is that uh, Gearman and where we're pushing Gearman is towards an environment where when we look at things like queues and MapReduce, why isn't really that pretty much that what you're doing there and your, your processing, your, your asynchronous processing that you're trying to do is really all essentially the same. So why lock somebody into MapReduce? Why lock somebody into a simple queuing concept? Let's build something that's a little more flexible. And I think a, a lot of traction we get in Gearman, uh, which occasionally surprises people, is around things like, hey, uh, it's not Java. Uh, it just runs as binaries on your machines. It integrates really well with multiple languages. So, you know, it integrates well with PHP. It integrates well with Ruby. Uh, you don't, you're not forced into, you know, well, it's a Java component, so this part of our architecture needs to be Java. We really don't care what language uh, you use. Uh, so, you know, if we can keep things that are ease of use, we keep people away from having conversations about, well, if you want to use this tool, you have to switch this language. Uh, we think we go down the right path. One of the things that we look for Drizzle as, as, as in these environments is also SQL. Uh, you still need relational operations. You still need to be able to do reporting. You know, not everybody wants to go out and write a, 
you know, a MapReduced Erlang function whenever time they need to dig up a report. You know, SQL, SQL has been around for a while and there's a reason for it. I mean, even if you look at Hadoop implementation day and, you know, Pig hasn't really gained all that much uh, that traction and you look at what has gained traction in the Hadoop world, it's the more SQL-like interface that they've come up with. Uh, so to me, the goal is, is let's create, you know, and work on interfaces around tools people already know necessarily how to use. And as far as the NoSQL movement, Sure, primary key lookup is awesome. I, I obviously I work on Memcached. Memcached is a NoSQL solution. It is designed for primary key lookup. That is what it does. It works really awesome. Uh, on the same token, can I write, uh, you know, an on-the-fly uh, reporting, uh, you know, by just writing a simple SQL statement to get back an answer? No, I obviously cannot do that. Uh, that's that's a problem sometimes with NoSQL. One of the other also problems with NoSQL movement has been it's often been defined by the fact that it doesn't support SQL, which means that you lose the fact that like you know we look at something like Couch. Couch is a, a for the most part you know single node HTTP uh, awesome. It does JSON. It's got it, it enables all kinds of new applications. Uh, but can you run every application you ever ran? Every kind of analytical type you know analytic design? No, you can't do analytics. That's not what it's designed for. So in some ways, the whole NoSQL term is this giant grab bag of features and uh, applications, and their only redeeming feature is they don't have one particular feature. I think the question is there is that what is what are you trying to get at? If you're trying to do a very fast, for instance, you need to do some kind of fast insertion rate, and for whatever reason, a, a more simplified interface than writing SQL insert statements go, uh, Okay, that's great. We can do that. Not a problem. We can crump really simple, you know, TCP IP interfaces where you can, you know, dump data through things. Uh, if you want to do some kind of a, you know, uh, some kind of a large analytical type query, well, that's not going to work out so much. On the other hand, we look at things like blobs. Blobs work horribly inside databases. Databases are great at small amounts of metadata that can be relationally intertwined with each other. But when you look at something like an image, should you be putting an image in a database? No, you should not be putting an image in a database. Um, and you shouldn't certainly be, you know, pulling images out of databases. That's one of those cases where primary key lookups uh, work much better. And if you look at the way a lot of database drivers uh, are even done under the hood, a lot of them do blob fetching, a lot of them have optimizations for this stuff, just because, well, these types of data never have worked very well in, in database in the first place. So I think that if we look at having databases where we have, you know, multiple interfaces to them, um, so that you can fetch blobs, you can fetch other pieces of data and not necessarily use SQL, I think there'll be, uh, I think there's a lot of advantage in that. The, the problem though in that world is that we don't have uh, any kind of interface yet. Uh, we have SQL, that's been standardized, it's been standardized for a while. In the other world, you know, Cassandra uses uh, a thrift interface, we see Google protobuffers, we see JSON retrieval, we see all of these different forms and methods, and no one wants to write an application and then suddenly know, oh, look, I wrote my application and I want to change my data store, and what do I got to do now? I have to rewrite everything to this other uh, environment. You know, one of the problems of that no SQL is that, well, it's no SQL. There's no standard there. There's nothing that says, by the way, we stored stuff in this next year. There's still going to be a project or product there that's going to use this same interface. Uh, and that's a big, pretty big downside when you think about like how long an application can live inside of an enterprise. You want to know that those interfaces will be around. Um, I think the closest interface we've had now that is ubiquitous is honestly Memcached at this point.